My name is Alex Barinka. I cover IPOs and tech M&A for us. So I cover basically the uh, business of scaling a business, which we are going to talk about here today. And also, if there are anyone in the room who's looking to sell their company or go public, then hopefully I'm your first call. You can come find me after, after the fact. But I want to introduce to you um, our two panelists today. Our third, Darnell, he's the CEO of Play Versus. Unfortunately, couldn't make it. My flight got delayed. I landed at 1 a.m. last night. His didn't make it. So um, we will hopefully get to hear from him another time. But um, Razwana Bashir, she's the CEO of Peak, um, and I'm going to let them introduce for a very specific reason. And Nate Checkets, he is the uh, CEO and founder of Verone. Why don't you two go ahead and give kind of the current 30-second uh, elevator pitch of where your company stands? Razwana, go ahead. Sure. Um, Peak is a platform for activities. We help consumers to book great things to do. So if you want to go zip lining, we do a wine tour, uh, you can come to peak.com. And we actually provide all the underlying software for the tour operators to come online. So we work with thousands of businesses to help them uh, power online bookings from their own website. So it's very similar to OpenTable. Nate? I can't compete with that accent, I apologize. But uh, I run a company called Roan. We are a new brand in the premium active space, so focused primarily on the men's market. And we've been around almost four years, coming up on our four-year birthday. But uh, we sell primarily direct to consumer. We also sell in Equinox, Nordstrom, Bloomingdale's. Um, just became the number one men's brand in Equinox, past Lulu and Nike this year. Um, so I've had some great growth and, uh, and really focused on kind of trying to own the premium men's space and active. And Nate, your company's four years old. Roswana, you're about five. Oh. And uh, when you think back to five years ago, when you did kind of get started at the ideation phase of putting a startup together, a very important thing, you got to have an idea or you got nothing. Was that the same description of what you thought you were going with? Walk us back to half a decade ago when you were kind of putting this idea together. Um, the idea was very similar, but we thought we could drive consumer demand first. Um, so we, you know, we started launching the site, and uh, we had all these people booking activities. And it turns out consumers want to book an activity in about six hours. Um, and, and what so was the initial idea? It was just idea? The same thing, book yep. great experiences. Um, the problem was that you booked a tour, and you thought in two hours you were going somewhere. Um, but we'd faked the availability. And, uh, and then it turned out we couldn't get hold of the merchant. And so about 40% of the time, we couldn't fulfill. Um, and that's a really bad consumer experience because you think you're going on a great trip with your family. So when you say fake the avail availability, just give us an idea of, of what that looked like. That just meant that we put schedules up and said, great, there's going to be a tour going out in two hours. You can go on that. Um, and then hope that we could call the merchant and, and figure it out. And actually, there are businesses that have been able to do that. Hotel Tonight did that. Thumbtack did that. But in our space, we couldn't. So we started with just B2C and very quickly had to pivot into B2B and, and provide the underlying software for the merchant. And Nate, for Roan, uh, where, did, where were you all four years ago when you first had this idea? Um, yeah. Akira, there was a uh, your mom, a pair of sweatpants. It started, I was working at the NFL, and uh, on Christmas, my mom got, I come from a large family, six kids. There's now 14 grandkids, so efficiency is the name of the game in Christmas shopping. And so my mom went in with my sister-in-law, who's Canadian, to a Lululemon store and bought all the guys some Lululemon sweatpants. And Christmas morning comes in, and I didn't really, I wasn't that familiar with the brand, but my brother-in-law was like, I'm absolutely not wearing this. This is a women's yoga brand. So then I go into work uh, at the NFL, which is, you know, you know we're in sports culture. It's, uh, it's that kind of feeling in the office. And Budweiser had sent a box for, of Lulu gear for the women in the office. They open up, they start going through it, and I make the mistake of saying, oh, I just got some Lululemon sweatpants. And the guy next to me said, oh, so you buy your underwear at Victoria's Secret. <laughs> and um, that's when I called my brother-in-law up, and I said, well, you know, it feels like there's an opportunity here. Uh, Premium women's had taken off. There's over 200 brands in the premium women's active space. They were actually zero focused 100% on men's when we launched. And we felt like there was a huge opportunity for guys who wanted the same level of quality, premium fit. And um, yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's how we got started. And in terms of how that's carried through today, it's, you know, I, I've done a couple of other startups, and there's almost always pivots. For us, the only real pivot we've made is we've actually opened up our wholesale distribution, which we thought we would never do. You know, direct to consumer was everything. Retail's dying. Um, you should never sell to wholesale. But Equinox has been a fantastic partner. Um, we also have great partners, partnerships with premium running stores like Jackrabbit and Nordstrom. And it's been a great way to acquire customers at negative acquisition costs, which is almost unheard of in the consumer mm -hmm. space. 
And, uh, and so we use that as a discovery tool to go. And, and I, when I think through a kind of the, the life cycle of a startup, recognizing opportunity, um, that's kind of what we just talked through there. You saw that there's something going on. Um, when you talk through your channels from where you're selling your retail, how far along in the business life cycle did you land at the channels that have been successful for you now? When you formed that business and you said, we need to get our product in the hand of customers, where did you start? And kind of how did that change over the, the course of a few yeah, years? Yeah, so we started, again, only on our website, direct to consumer. We thought, we don't need wholesale partners. We've got the internet. We've got Facebook. We've got Instagram. There's, there's no reason to have brick and mortar. But it's a lot you, of noise. There's yeah, a lot of noise on the internet. But when you think about it, I mean, first off, Facebook costs of acquisition have gone up over 9x over the last uh, five to six years. So there's so much noise in the space. But in addition to that, I was at breakfast um, with Neil Blumenthal, the founder of Warby Parker, and he told me a crazy stat that 90% of eyewear is still purchased in physical mm -hmm. retail. And you know that sounds obvious. Maybe it was even 95%. A lot of it's done in optometrists. But I looked at apparel, so much apparel is still, per we talk about how Amazon's eating the world, and yes, they are, but so much uh, apparel is still purchased in physical retail environments. And retail, the role of retail has changed, but it's still an important part of the tool. And so we, we pivoted um, almost immediately as we started to study that, and it was a great move for us because men in particular are tactile shoppers. They want to touch product, they want to feel it. They don't necessarily like the idea Guys of shopping. I'm not going to go there, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, they, they want they want that tactile experience of touching the fabric and um, and putting it on. To fit is obviously mm -hmm. important, uh, but they don't necessarily like shopping in a mall, so it's it's tricky. Like that's yeah. why Equinox is a great partnership for us. So knowing your customer, knowing where your customer lives, you said you Rosanna, you started uh, selling straight to consumer. Um, did that change? Yeah, so we, we actually started selling to businesses. Mm -hmm. And so we had to build out an inside sales team. Mm -hmm. um, so people being able to call those merchants. And actually, um, traditionally, when you're selling software to small businesses, uh, you use a subscription model. And that's mm -hmm. what we did. And so we're going to charge you a few hundred dollars a month. Actually, one of the, the things that we tested that has actually been incredibly effective for us is that we now use a transaction model. So if you're a small business and you do, you do you know, great tours, um, you have a whitewater rafting company, um, we'll actually provide you with software um, that has a very negligible cost up front, but we'll take 8.5% of every transaction that goes through your website. Um, and so that was actually a great model for us in terms of aligning ourselves with the small business. Um, it was very low risk for them. Um, they suddenly started seeing 30 to 40% increases in bookings through their website. And so all of a sudden, they're actually making a lot more money and they're comfortable with you taking that card. Um, one of the nice things about that is that traditionally with SMB mm -hmm. uh, software, um, you've, you know, the, the margins on that aren't great. But once you start taking part of the transaction, um, you're actually able to very effectively sell um, to these SMBs and have great kind of lifetime value to CAC and things like that. So that was something that we figured out pretty early on and then double down on and, and now have very high conversion rates because it's a pretty low risk offer. When you do make that decision to change from a subscription model to um, the model you're using now, what kind of thinking went into that? I, it, that seems a little bit scary. That's where you're recognizing your revenue. That's where your money is coming from. How did you kind of think through that shift process to something that's not necessarily the norm for a small business? Yeah. Um, to be honest, we were willing to just test two or three different things. And our perspective was really just how can we make sure that we can create the most value. And one of the things I think that we've learned is... Um, you know, ultimately, if your, the businesses grow with you, you want to capture some of that value. And often, trying to change prices isn't a good way to do that. So if we could align um, on some kind of mechanism, which was either the transaction volume um, or, or the dollars that were going through, that would be much better so that as businesses grew with us, um, we would make more money uh, as well. And I think that's something that OpenTable did effectively because they charge per seat. So if, you're, uh, if your business is using that. Um, so we knew that that was something we had to align around, um, and so we're, we're willing to test a few different models with different percentages mm -hmm. being charged. Um, in the end, as we tested more and more, we realized this was very, very effective. Um, I think one of the things that's been a side effect we didn't necessarily uh, manage for, um, but is there, is that the business is seasonal. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, we're pretty seasonal, right? So we can make a ton of money in the summer, and then September sucks, actually, right? So um, we definitely had to manage for that, and that requires 
requires us having to predict uh, the seasonality curves of thousands of other businesses mm -hmm. and things like that. So there are side effects to it that you have to think through. For us, you know, look, lots of travel companies are pretty seasonal, and so that's okay. And we think in the future the market can understand that, but it does create something that's different to a traditional SaaS model. Was there a turning point when you got a certain number or pool or, or a certain customer where you're like, look, this is actually really working? It was a little bit linear, actually, mm -hmm. for us. We just kind of kept getting more and more businesses on board, and, and everything just got better and better. The mm -hmm. salespeople were finding it easier to close. All of a sudden, people, every single month, someone, you know, <laughs> there's a sales record that gets beaten every single month. You're like, okay, well, this is working. Um, I think when it really kind of set in for us was when larger businesses started working mm -hmm. with us. And all of a sudden, you're making six-figure numbers on merchants, and you're kind of like, okay, great, wow, this works, because somebody's giving us more than $100,000 of value for the software that we built. And Nate, uh, and Roan, was there a, a turning point customer-wise? You talk about Equinox, you talk about Peloton. Those are names that uh, consumers know yeah. are so important in the retail space is that brand awareness. Where was that turning point for you in terms of getting a partner on board? You know, I think there, there's kind of all these moments. Running a startup is like riding a roller coaster. It's almost why you become unemployable anywhere else because it's like you, know, you have these highs and these lows, these moments where you feel like you're taking over the world. And um, you know, Peloton is a great example of, of a business that we worked with and scaled with. Um, and you know, my aunt will call me, and she doesn't understand how retargeting ads work. She's like, "I just saw you on CNN.com," and I'm like, "I don't have the heart to tell her that that's just how retargeting ads work." So I'm just like, "Yeah, things are going amazing." Um, and and so you know, like you have these great moments, but then you also have challenging moments. There hasn't been one particular, there's been great articles that have been written about us. Bloomberg's been a great partner um, in covering our story. And, and so great PR articles are kind of fun because you get a lot of inbound uh, interest in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, you know, we keep, uh, we keep exceeding our own sales goals and we have huge numbers that we expect to hit. So mm -hmm. it's kind of this challenge of being satisfied, but not being too satisfied to kind of continue to, to grow. Proud but never satisfied was the cross-country coach euphemism that, that I used to get. When you do think about kind of where, how you walk that line um, of, of being happy with what you have and then pushing for more, how much does focus come into play? Because I see so many times these younger companies, they want to do everything, they get really excited, something's going really well, and next thing you know, they have their hand in 12 different pots and they're overextended and stuff unravels. It's, it's honestly the single most important factor, I think, in uh, business's success. You know, in the consumer world, there's a lot of great examples of this. Um, you know, uh, I, uh, I'm wearing these Taft shoes. I think Andre's uh, an investor in this brand. All they do is they make premium men's dress shoes. That's it. Now, they've got really cool designs, and it's great, but it's allowed them to scale really, really nicely. Allbirds is a great example of this. People have been trying to get them to do apparel for a long time. All they make are shoes. And one of the things we fell victim to is you can fall victim to your own hype. So people will say, oh, you guys would make a great golf line. We're like, you know what? We would make a great golf line. Let's go make a great golf line. And then all of a sudden, you've given your marketing team more things that they need to cover from a storytelling perspective. You've given your sales team another story that they need to get out in the market. You've given your design and product team something else that they need to create. And so focus, we've, we've kind of gone like this and then back, back into focusing on core franchises and deeper into the styles that we think are going to be successful. And that has really what's given us a huge lift this year. We're growing faster in our fourth year than we have in any other year. Are there certain things that you felt really sad you had to part with? Yes. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, you know, I could give you specific product examples, um, you know, but, but I think it's like, there's just such beauty and focus. And Apple's a great example of this. They talk about it all the time. Steve Jobs always said, I'm as proud of the things that we don't do as the things that we do. And um, I think for us, you know, what I'm most excited about is growth and winning and and being in the competitive landscape and grabbing market share um, and impacting people. And I try and remind myself that in, in order to have those wins, I need to give up kind of what it would be like if we made a sleeveless hoodie. That's not a 
product I want to make anyways, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Would anyone wear a sleeveless hoodie? Anyone wear a sleeveless Believe it or not, it's or? big in the oh, boxing we got a, world. We got a few? We got it's a few? Bi it's big in the boxing world, yeah. <laughs> Maybe you should rethink, or maybe yeah. that's just noise. But when I think about, so, so you entered a really, a really crowded space, right? Retail is a very crowded space. There wasn't necessarily somebody servicing your customer. Uh, Rosanna, when you got into the travel booking space, I think back five years ago, and folks weren't really talking about it like they were today. How much did the change in the overall consumer sentiment toward booking platforms and over the last five years impacted your business? Uh, it impacted a lot because consumers just expect to be able to book online. Um, none of us want to make phone calls anymore to anyone. Um, and um, on, on top of that, I think what you see is um, mobiles really revolutionized mm -hmm. this space because a lot of the businesses that we work with are in the middle of a beach, they're in the forest, they're in the city, they're running around doing experiences for people. Um, I think there's also a, just a bigger market trend, which is... Um, you know, allowing people to spend more of their money on experiences. And certainly millennials or kind of younger generations don't really have their identity, you know, locked into the kind of car they drive or the house that they own in the same way. It's really based around what you do and what you do with your time. And so when you have a world that is shifting towards more of these experiences, the fact that those marketplaces didn't exist or it's very hard to book was a problem. And so I think that's been a lot of the reason that we've been able to unlock opportunity in this space is because of that. Before that consumer change in behavior, I mean, changing consumer behavior is so difficult. When you all started as a startup, uh, how were you kind of dealing with that, getting your customer base used to doing the thing that your business does? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think consumers do all want to book online. Mm -hmm. So that, that wasn't an issue. It was more just helping businesses recognize mm -hmm. that that was a need and that they needed to kind of adapt to technology. And I think a lot of that we did through simplicity. So we have really simple mobile apps and iPad apps. And it turns out that when businesses are getting millions of bookings and we're powering all of that through our technology, um, millions of people are being checked into their tour using an iPad app that, that we provide, um, people can see the value that's creating. It's also just these businesses see big increases in revenue. Mm -hmm. and so that, honestly, the easiest way for us to get people to want to use technology is to know that they're going to make more money and be more profitable. Um, and for a small business, that's really, really important. And so we've been able really to kind of sell through dollars and say, mm -hmm. we're going to make your business better. Um, and that works really well. On, on the big picture and kind of consumer level, I think um, a lot of what we, we are able to do now, though, is have a, a really unique set of information that nobody else has. So we've got um, over 10,000 activities in America. We've got um, over half a million reviews that are all verified of, the, of those uh, those things. And we've got dynamic pricing, so businesses can give you the best price if it's two or three hours before the tour. So we've now amassed kind of this data set that allows us to serve the consumer so much better because we're providing all the underlying technology. When I do think about the marketplace, Airbnb is obviously a name that's entered the space uh, with their new experiences. How do you think about how you're competing with the likes of an Airbnb, a, you know, yeah, tens of billions of dollar valuation company. Yeah, um, well, the space is about $180 billion. Mm -hmm. And today, there's not one business that's valued at more than a billion dollars in this space, right? And so um, today, I'd say that over the next three to five years, I think there's going to be a few businesses that will be built that will be worth billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And so that's exciting for us because we're the largest standalone player. And um, we've raised about $40 million and uh, kind of, you know, there wanting to go out and scale the business a lot more than we've even done now. So I think actually um, the level of interest that you're seeing in the space now um, just shows the opportunity that's there. And I think there's so much opportunity that many of us can win. So we've, we've talked about the ideation. We've talked about kind of the early phases, building up the sales cycle, finding the right customer to sell to. Y'all were there for all parts of that life cycle with both of your companies, from just a few folks to uh, tens to hundreds of employees. How have you thought about how your job has changed, Roswana, since you founded, since the company was at its early days, to what you're doing now? Um, yeah, I think, I think I've just had to learn to delegate a little yeah. bit. Um, I, um, I think, uh, you know, I was a little bit of a control freak, liked having excellence in everything. And so, uh, you know, I, uh, I, was, I was used to having really, really high quality on everything that I did. And so, you know, it turns, I'm a very nerdy kid. I went to Oxford and, and then I went to HBS. And so uh, slowly but surely, I've been the person that like is comfortable making sure that I can do all of these different things. And all of a sudden, first off, you don't know as much as mm -hmm. other people do. And second, you've just got a time capacity crunch. And so I think really a lot of it has been around delegation. Mm -hmm. And then um, 
bringing great talent into the team. And I think that being able to have great people that you can trust in and that you really believe can do the job better than you um, is, is huge. And so I think it's been having to work really hard to get people excited about mm -hmm. joining the company when it's pretty nascent. Um, and they've already done that before and they've run a big company before um, to come and join you um, and be part of your team. So. How do you know when you can trust someone? <laughs> um, uh, 